So to start this session, uh, first of all, my name is Sarang Nother. I'm one of the full-time researchers doing research um, for the Monero Research Lab. Um, Brandon is working on uh, another talk he's going to be giving, so I'll be leading this session and possibly the next one. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Jerry Brito, um, who is with Coin Center and is going to be speaking today about the relationship between peer-to-peer -peer payments and the idea of open societies. So let's welcome Jerry. Well, thank you all so much for having me, and thanks for Brandon and the uh, uh, Monero um, folks for um, inviting me to do this. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the case for electronic cash and um, how we're talking about it in Washington, D.C. So the, let me see, how does this, there we go. The first thing I want to tell you is a little bit about Coin Center. Um, I'm the executive director of Coin Center. Coin Center has been around for about five years. We're based in D.C. Um, and we're an independent nonprofit that's focused on the public policy issues that affect cryptocurrencies and open permissionless uh, blockchain networks um, like Monero, Bitcoin, Zcash, Ethereum, the like. Um, we basically uh, do three things. We do education, we do public policy research, and we do advocacy. So education is where we spend a lot of our time, and what that means is making sure that policymakers, and that means members of Congress, their staff, um, understand this technology, right? If they have a question about what it is, how it works, why it's important, um, we can answer it. And we do that through one-on-one -on -one briefings, one-to-many briefings. Um, we um, have testified at almost every um, hearing that Congress has held on cryptocurrency since 2013. Um, even before the center existed, somebody from Coin Center has been testifying um, and doing that. As we have these conversations, um, inevitably we get questions that we don't have the answer to, and typically that's because it's not a question about how the technology works, which we can answer or find somebody who can answer that, um, but it's a question of law. Um, and typically where technology has outpaced the law and now there's a gap and regulators and policymakers are, are going to want to fill it. Um, and so that's where we engage in our policy research. We develop policy thinking that helps regulators uh, fill those gaps because they're going to fill it whether we come up with ideas or not. Um, and what we want to do is make sure that they can meet their ends while preserving as much as possible the freedom to innovate. And then the last thing we do is we advocate, we lobby. Uh, we lobby for our preferred solutions. Uh, an important thing to note is we're not a trade association. Um, we don't have members. We don't represent any companies or any particular persons. Um, we represent ourselves. So if you're familiar with uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, what they are to the internet, we aspire to be for open blockchain permissionless networks. Um, so that's who we are and what we do. And um, we've spent the last five years focused mainly on um, consumer protection issues, which means state money transmission licensing, banking um, uh, licensing and stuff like that, securities regulation, um, because those have been the things that have been sort of most pressing for regulators, also tax. Um, but now we are focusing on privacy uh, more and more. And uh, over the last three months, we've published several reports um, focused on privacy, which um, I encourage you to go online at coincenter.org and, and check out, um, where we've been talking more and more about privacy. And what I'm going to do today is sort of give you a presentation that um, sort of um, presents um, these papers, and it presents for you the way we talk about privacy um, to folks in Washington, D.C., to policymakers and regulators. And the way we do that is through the lens of cash. We are making a moral case for cash, that it, cash is necessary for an open liberal society, which folks in D.C. care about still, um, <laughs> despite what you may have heard. Um, and, um, uh, and we also make uh, sort of a legal case um, and a constitutional case for why electronic cash uh, is something that's constitutionally protected. Um, so that's how we talk about it, and that's what I'm going to walk you through today. So the first thing is, as I say, we talk about cash and the importance of cash. And people often, when they, probably not in this crowd, but when people hear about cash, they just think of money. 
And I think these things are synonyms. And so the first thing we have to explain is that no, cash isn't just money. Cash has a very particular uh, meaning. So cash is a bearer instrument. So you've got it and you can use it. Um, cash is person to person. So you can give it to somebody else. And when you do, they have it and you don't. And that's how you use it. And so that makes it, number one, permissionless. There's no intermediary. There's nobody between you that you have to seek permission. You can just hand it to somebody and you've used it. So it's permissionless and it's censorship resistant because again, there's nobody who can stop you from uh, using it because it's bearer, right? And, and that makes it person to person and that also makes it private. So there's no reason why anybody um, necessarily has to know of any transaction except the parties to the transaction. Indeed, maybe even only one person. So if you drop a $100 bill into a donation box at a church, you're the only one who knows that that transaction happened. So those are, you know, when we talk about cash, that's what we're talking about. And what we're seeing is uh, that increasingly, um, the more developed countries are, the more cashless um, they are becoming. So uh, we see this um, very prominently in uh, Nordic countries. Uh, so Sweden is fast becoming uh, a cashless society. Uh, according to its central bank, cash transactions accounted for only 2% of all uh, the value of all payments made in 2015. And that figure is expected to drop to just 0.5% by 2020. Um, and there's a majority of bank branches in Sweden right now um, that no longer keep cash on hand. Um, and it's very rare to find, inc you know, increasingly rare to find uh, ATMs. Uh, in Sweden, and it's again similar um, uh, to countries like Norway, uh, Denmark, Iceland, Finland. I was just in um, Norway, and yeah, I can attest to you. I didn't even take any any paper notes, American or uh, European, to Norway my entire time that I was there. Um, South Korea targets a, um, uh, has 2020 as a target date for phasing out all. Um, paper notes and coins. And increasingly, you have sort of anti-cash uh, campaigns that are both corporate and government. So um, on the corporate side, you can imagine it's uh, mainly the payment processors who um, profit from every transaction that gets made uh, through an intermediary. Um, so Visa, MasterCard, they will run campaigns, um, advertising campaigns aimed at consumers with different kinds of uh, incentives to get you to switch to you know, only using credit cards and debit cards. Um, but more importantly, they will go and have campaigns aimed at uh, merchants and vendors where they will go to a restaurant and say, we will pay you and we will give you a free point of sale system and we will give you um, monetary incentives if you um, agree to make your establishment uh, cash free, no cash. So everything has to be uh, going through our system. And of course, um, Governments also um, increasingly uh, would like to see uh, a cashless society, number one, because um, uh, they want, you know, they, they feel they can better address um, illicit use of cash that way, um, which is kind of like uh, uh, using a hammer to, you know, kill an ant. Um, uh, but also, I think there, if you can get rid of cash and all money is basically deposits, um, the central bank is gonna have uh, better control over its monetary policy. You can do things like negative interest rates. So that's uh, gonna be of, of interest to them. Uh, China is really remarkable uh, in this story um, because it has become really increasing, increasingly cashless um, in a very short period of time. Um, the move away from cash in China happened in just a few years. Um, while cash accounted for 96% of payments in 2012, uh, today that number is below 15%. Um, and as of 2018, more than uh, half billion Chinese use mobile payments. Um, and so that's basically Tencent's WeChat Pay and uh, Alipay, which are the dominant payment platforms. And they have a combined market share of 92%. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, and as more and more commerce happens online, um, we're only gonna see you know, less and less uh, use of cash. And uh, at some point, uh, banks may, may choose to just stop uh, making it. So when you have a cashless society, 
um, that is going to be necessarily an intermediated society. Uh, and I don't, you know, usually with a policymaker or um, a, a lay person, I usually have to explain what this means. I don't have to do that to this audience, I don't think. Obviously, if there's no cash that is bare and peer-to-peer, -peer, all transactions must go through an intermediary. Um, and when that happens, it means that the money that you're using is no longer permissionless, right? Which means that it's no longer censorship resistant. You can be, you know, somebody in between can decide, number one, we're not gonna give you an account, so you can't participate. Or we can say this transaction we're not gonna allow because we don't like it. It's also not private. Um, so in a, in, a, in a cashless society, every transaction that you do is necessarily always surveilled. Um, and I think people just don't, don't stop to think about that. Um, and again, China is just a perfect example of this, where you go there today and you look really odd in some of the major metropolitan areas if you try to use paper money. Um, what you do if you go there, um, what you'll see is that there are QR codes everywhere uh, that basically allow you to pay with Alipay. So if you want to um, pay for lunch, this is um, how you do it. Uh, okay. If you want to buy uh, some coconut water from a vendor off the street, you're gonna use a QR code with Alipay. You have to press five times before this thing advances, which kind of ruins the momentum of the uh, fun presentation. This is a, um, a street musician. A street musician um, who is doing a performance and when he's done, he puts up his QR code so people can tip him. Right? So even buskers use um, Alipay. This is really weird. Um, this is a uh, bike share. So you want to rent a bike, you unlock it using um, Alipay. Um, if you want to get a fee-for-service medical scan, um, you use Alipay. Um, this is a um, sort of an automated uh, lending library where you can borrow a book by paying. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's just a QR code, that's what you use to pay. And so this is great because it's super efficient and everybody has it and it's a you know, great network effect. But that means that Alipay knows where you are with your bike, what you read, if you're sick, right? And this also means that so does the Chinese government because there really is very little distinction between the Chinese government and Alipay um, and WeChat Pay. Uh, and as you all probably know, something that we sometimes have to explain to folks, but I think you all probably know, um, in China, uh, government authorities are developing a social credit system. Um, that they're basically gonna use to create a database of all citizens, and citizens are gonna get a rating um, based on their civic virtue. And so it's gonna look at things like, are you getting um, traffic fines? Are you returning your library books on time? What are your grades in school? Um, uh, are you jaywalking, um, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the inputs that goes into this uh, social um, credit uh, score is gonna be what you buy, right? And how responsible you are with your money and what your credit score is and whether you're being, um, uh, you know, civically virtuous um, according to the state with what you're buying. So here is um, a um, director of Alipay uh, giving an interview um, where he's talking about their uh, rollout of their, um, uh, basically their own credit system um, uh, where they're basically doing um, consumer credit scoring, which and then that in turn becomes part of the uh, social credit score. And he says, someone who plays video games for 10 hours a day, for example, would be considered an idle person. And someone who frequently buys diapers would be considered as probably a parent, who on balance is more likely to have a sense of responsibility. And they can tell this by what you're purchasing, by your purchasing habits and your transactions. Uh, if you have a low social credit score, that could mean for you slower internet speeds, res restricted access to restaurants, nightclubs or golf courses, and even the removal of the right to travel freely abroad, or even internally. Um, today, there are all kinds of people who cannot travel internally um, within a certain uh, area because 
they have a, so, a, a low social score, um, and again, they can be controlled because if there's if you have to use a intermediated money to get on the train, and you're not allowed to buy a train ticket to a certain you know beyond a certain area, this can all be automated through the money because it's all uh, intermediated. And by the way, one thing that's interesting. It's not interesting, it's horrifying, is your social credit score isn't only affected um, by your own activity, it's also affected by the activity of your friends and family. Um, so you have an incentive to make sure that your friends and family are following the rules, um, or to at least not be friends with people who have a low social score. And, and again, this, uh, this is all tied in through social media as well. So, Ultimately, in an intermediated society, um, your account can be locked. You can basically be um, locked out of society. Um, and uh, anyhow, that's a very bad thing. What we want, however, is an open society. Um, and an open society is the opposite of an authoritarian state um, like China. Uh, and the hallmark of an open society uh, is, is uh, a free competition of ideas, right, that drives progress. Um, and in an open society, challenges to status quo thinking are not only tolerated, um, they are valued and protected. Um, an open society works, however, only if individuals are free to engage uh, in critical thinking to develop, communicate and critique and accept or reject ideas. Um, that in turn requires freedom of thought and expression and association, um, which is why open societies tend to be liberal democracies uh, that guarantee civil liberties under a rule of law. Um, and it's important for us when we're talking to folks in DC about this to draw that contrast, right, between um, what we don't want, which is something like China, and an open society, which folks in government, especially folks um, in law enforcement and national security, um, they are, by and large, doing what they do for a living because they care about liberal values, they care about the Constitution and the values the Constitution stands for, and they want to see an open society. There's a balance, I, you know, between um, liberty and order, and I think a lot of folks who are in law enforcement, national security, and policymakers, um, because it's their job to keep order, to sort of, uh, you know, have more go more towards the order side of the, of the ledger. Um, but I think you can make them recognize that um, there's a balance there. Um, and uh, you, gotta, you have to be careful that in getting order, you don't give up too much liberty. And this is why it's important to, to point this out to them. And what we s explain is that privacy is essential to freedom of thought, to freedom of speech, and to association, not only because it prevents would-be censors from discovering thought crimes, but also because of the chilling effects that come from knowing that one is being watched all the time, especially um, by an authority. So what we explain is that cash, uh, or sorry, I should say a cashless society, um, an a cashless society is an intermediated society. An intermediate society is not compatible with an open society, right? An open society requires freedom of thought, expression, and assembly. And those freedoms require privacy and autonomy. Um, and so let me give you just two examples of how intermediation is undermining um, these values. So the first example is um, something that happened with uh, Target. Uh, this was about four years ago, I want to say five years ago. Um, the New York Times ran a um, really extensive profile of their, uh, of Target's marketing um, that uses statistics, right? So they hired a bunch of statistics, a bunch of quants um, to help them with their uh, marketing. And so um, they developed um, some really interesting um, uh, ways to market to folks. Um, and they have one anecdote in that story which is really, really crystallizes um, what intermediation means for autonomy and for privacy. And it's this, it's that um, there was a guy who came into a Target store very angry, very mad, um, and he wanted to talk to the manager, and the manager came out, 
and he had um, flyers, uh, target mailers that had been sent to his daughter who was in high school. And he's like, you know, these are all mailers that were sent to her for cribs and baby clothes. Um, and she's, you know, 17. Are you trying, you know, what is target, what is this? You're trying to suggest you should get pregnant, what is this? And the manager didn't know what this was and was very sorry and apologized and, um, you know, he went away. Um, the manager called him uh, a couple days later to just apologize again and, and to, and, you know, just talk to him. And the guy said, you know, I owe you an apology. Um, he said, things have been going on in my house that I wasn't aware of and she's due in September. So how did Target know before she had told his, her father that she was pregnant. And the answer is, is that when you shop at Target, um, you are assigned a unique identifier. And that unique identifier, and this is not optional, you don't opt into this, right? If you use a credit card, your credit card number is going to be used to, tar to basically um, identify it. Um, and then your um, purchasing habits are gonna be tracked. And what Target um, did is that it basically had a uh, maternity, um, like a maternity uh, club for women who wanted to sign up and get discounts on maternity stuff. And so they knew the shopping patterns of people who they knew were pregnant. And then they just mapped those onto the broader population of folks. And so they could identify not just who was pregnant, but when they were probably due. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that was really remarkable is that the, the, the um, statistician who was interviewed by the New York Times, and by the way, he was interviewed for this story, um, and he was very forthcoming with, you know, he was very excited about what he had built, because what he, what he had built could, could basically learn a lot about people. Um, and uh, later, uh, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, basically Target's PR folks got a sense of what the New York Times story was really about, and, and he stopped cooperating um, with that. But one of the things that he explained to, to, um, to New York Times before that happened was that the Target executives who came to him with the, the problem, the way they put it to him was, hey, is there a way that if we, and this is a verbatim, if we wanted to figure out if a customer's pregnant, even if she didn't want us to know, can you do that, all right? And so, look, I mean, I think it's easy to, it's easy to say, um, what's the big deal here, right? These are transactions that are happening publicly. Um, Target is just taking note of, of stuff that's happening publicly. Well, the problem is, is that, again, you don't have to consent to be tracked this way. And the fact that they were trying to hide it, I, can, I think kind of tells me that they knew they were doing something wrong, right? And so this is really an affront to dignity um, and to autonomy, um, because again, they were she was deprived of, you know, her uh, uh, of her being able to tell her father herself on her, on her own terms, right? Um, so how could she have prevented being tracked? There's only one way: she could have paid in cash, right? If she had paid in cash for her transactions, that's how she could have prevented this from happening. And we really can't just get rid of cash if we don't want this to happen. The other example I want to um, share with you has to do with the National Rifle Association. Um, now, say what you will, you know, you might like guns, you might not like guns. The National Rifle Association, um, at the end of the day, what is it? It is a uh, association of individuals, right, so freedom of assembly. It's an association of individuals who come together to do what? To exercise their First Amendment rights because all the NRA does is that they publish advocacy materials, right? They also have classes and things like that, but what they do mostly is publish advocacy material and advocate and speak in defense of the Second Amendment, which is an, another uh, right guaranteed. Is that three left? Okay. Um, and so it's so so you know that's what they do. They they exercise their 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 constitutional rights to defend further constitutional rights. Um, so here's what happened with the NRA. Um, 
essentially after um, there was a re there was a school shooting and kind of in response to that, um, New York State Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo um, basically directed um, his regulators to make sure that the NRA was shut out from any sort of financial institution. And so let me read you from the press release um, that New York State um, put out. It said the headline was, Governor Andrew M. Cuomo today directed the Department of Financial Services to urge insurance companies, New York State chartered banks, and other financial service companies licensed in New York to review any relationships they may have with the National Rifle Association and other similar organizations. Upon this review, the companies are encouraged to consider whether such ties harm their corporate reputations and jeopardize public safety. And if it wasn't clear enough, um, Financial Services Superintendent Maria Volo um, made it clear later in the same press release, uh, and this is a quote from her, DFS urges all insurance companies and banks doing business in New York to join the companies that have already discontinued their arrangements with the NRA. So this is remarkable, right? This is a governor telling financial intermediaries over which he has serious power that they must cut off one of his political opponents, not because that opponent broke any law, but because it engages in speech and advocacy that is at odds with the governor's views, right? And think about it. If this is successful, then the NRA is just the first one. Tomorrow, you know, it could be uh, in uh, Alabama or Georgia, it could be Planned Parenthood, where the governor says, I don't like them, cut them off. And if the NRA is cut off from, the, from having a bank account, and we live in an intermediate society without any cash, they're gone. They can't uh, operate. It's a, it's a death sentence. And so in a world that is increasingly intermediated and increasingly cashless, we have to have electronic cash, right? Because if cash is essential to an open society, and society is going cashless, we need to have electronic cash. And that is where I'm out of time, and I was gonna to talk to you about the law, but maybe I can do that in, uh, uh, later. You guys can come up and ask me any questions you want. And with that, I'll say thank you.